Hello, my name is Wildstag, and thank you for tuning in to another used book rant. Today, I'm going to be covering this book, The Seven Daughters of Eve, which I purchased at McKay Books in Manassas, Virginia. I have an interesting relationship with this book. First and foremost is the publication information. It was published in 2001, and it's written by... Brian Sykes. The subtitle is The Science That Reveals Our Genetic Ancestry. The back matter says Brian Sykes is a professor of genetics at the Institute of Molecular Medicine at Oxford University and editor of the Humane Inheritance Genes, Language, and Evolution. The cover design was by Deborah Morton Hoyt and the clay figurine by Karen Fredrickson. The clay figurine on the uh, mention is the design in the middle, which is a Venus figurine. One of those figurines that is considered to be a symbol of fertility. It's not a book about fertility symbols per se, but it is a book about mothers and prehistoric Neolithic mothers. In addition to all that, when I purchased it at McKay Books, I bought this for $3.53. Previously, I had read this. I checked this out of the local library back in, I want to say like 2007 or 2008. I had an interest, a dream of becoming a biologist working for the National Park Service and doing some education in that way. And so I had an interest in these biology lesson books including one of them on my shelves, I think in the other room, titled Why Evolution is True. This one also is one I picked up in middle and high school. At the time, it was more advanced than you know I probably should have been reading, and I've read it since then. I don't think my understanding really changed. It is a very well-written book that communicates the material to the layman very well. I will say, however, that this book is Eurocentric in a big way. The introduction is about the Iceman in um, Italy. I believe the Iceman later named Utsi. I've actually seen, I think, a copy that was made at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. when I used to live there. Uh, well, in a suburb of D.C., that is. As the author explains in the introduction, Iceman's relative found in Dorset, my part in this story begins at the Institute of Molecular Medicine in Oxford, where I am a professor of genetics. The institute is part of Oxford University, though geographically and temperamentally removed from the arcane world of the college cloisters. It is full of doctors and scientists who are working away applying the new technologies of genetics and molecular biology to the field of medicine. And so that's the background of the author. It is written in a first-person perspective for the most part as he discusses how he came by this research and how he developed it. And... What he discusses in this first chapter is that he was working on Utsi, the Iceman, found in Italy, and he had a genetic bank. And when he published his findings in Science, the leading U.S. scientific journal, he also let it slip that there are people found in their bank, their genetic storage, that they found someone who is descended from the Iceman. Lois Rogers from Sunday Times asked the crucial question, you say you found exactly the same DNA in modern Europeans. Who are they? What do you mean, who are they? They are from our collection of DNA samples from all over Europe. Yes, but who? I have no idea. We keep the identities of the donors on a separate file. And anyway, samples are always given on the basis of a strict undertaking of confidentiality. But he did some digging based off that question. Journalists have a different mindset than a scientist, and he wouldn't have thought to research that. But now that it's been asked of him, he did. He found that the sample, Lab 2803, was one of them. The series prefix, Lab, meant it was either from someone working in the laboratory 
or from a visitor or friend. He checked the number against the database containing the names of volunteers, and it was Marie Mosley. And M Marie Mosley had the same DNA as the Iceman, which meant that Marie was a relative, not necessarily directly descended from, but a relative of the Iceman. And so he contacted her, and she gave permission to her, her name to be released as one of these descendants of the Iceman. And he says he started looking into tracing these ancestries because of this hype around the Iceman. For the most part, the book is about these connections and how he got from point A to point B. He discusses the first Europeans, the, the Neolithic age, how he, they were able to determine different ages of the Neolithic period based on like the stone tools they used and how sophisticated they were. And this book is only 295 or so pages long. The focus on these seven daughters of Eve doesn't start specifically until page 195 in the chapter simply titled The Seven Daughters. Now, the chapter right before that is called Adam Joins the Party, and he narrates in the book that he's been tracking this mitochondrial DNA and these different branches found in all of humanity. But what he did also find was a Y chromosome ancestry. These seven daughters of Eve are specifically Eurocentric because these are seven lineages that he has found in ethnic Europeans. Some of these are likely to be found in other parts of the world, such as Africa, you know, Northern Africa and the Middle East and even Central Asia. But for the most part, these are people, um, mitochondrial lineages that are European. The seven clusters had ages of between 45,000 and 10,000 years. What these estimates actually tell us is the length of time it has taken for all the mutations that we see within a cluster to have arisen from a single founder sequence. And by purely logical deduction, the inescapable but breathtaking conclusion is that the single founder sequence at the root of each of the seven clusters was carried by just one woman in each case. So the ages we had given to each of these clusters became the times in the past when these seven women, the clan mothers, actually lived. It required only that I gave them names to bring them to life and to arouse in me and everyone who has heard about them an intense curiosity about their lives. Ursula, Xenia, Helena, Velda, Tara, Katrin, and Jasmine became real people. I chose names that began with the letter by which the clusters had been known since we adopted Antonio Taroni's alphabetic classification system. Ursula was the clan mother of Cluster U. Cluster H had Helena at its root. Jasmine was the common ancestor of Cluster J, and so on. There are a few qualifications you needed to be a clan mother. The first is that you needed to have daughters. That is obvious because the gene we are following, mitochondrial DNA, is passed from mother to daughter. A woman who had only sons could not be a clan mother because her children would never pass on the mitochondrial DNA they received from her. So that is the first rule. The second is that you had to have had at least two daughters. It's easiest to see why by looking at things the other way around from the present to the past. The clan mother is the most recent maternal ancestor that all members of a clan have in common. And so... Effectively, what he's saying, if the first mother had only one daughter, and then that daughter only had one daughter, and it goes that way for seven generations, the progenitor of that mutation isn't the one that would be the most common ancestor. It would be the matrilineal line down to the last mother in that line, the most recent mother in that line, to have had only one daughter. So these are women that are having multiple children, which is partially where that fertility theme comes in. But on top of that, these are women that are having multiple children and multiple daughters. They probably had multiple sons, but they had to have had multiple daughters. And this lineage then branches out from there. The seven daughters of Eve, he then describes the places they lived, or the likely places they lived, perhaps the likely 
lives they lived. Woven into this is also domestication of animals and domestication of plants. That these people, so all of these people, all of these ancestral clan mothers had to have been originated before the first domestication of animals and at some point during the domestication of plants. Some of these clans may actually predate the domesticated dog, but not all of them. The current belief is that dogs were domesticated around 23,000 years ago, which is about half as old as the oldest of these seven clans, but twice as old as the youngest of these clans. It then goes into a discussion, a theoretical discussion of those lives, and it also takes the time to discuss some of the noteworthy descendants. So, for example, from Clan Ursula is the Cheddar Man found in England. And so he weaves together all these different parts of history together to say these are the ancestors of all Europeans. And through this research, we can begin to understand the commonality between all of us. I don't know specifically how much this branches into Africa, for example, or Eastern Asia, or Australia, or the Americas, but a lot of these, you know, communities are older than 45,000 years old. Europe's population is relatively young. I think the only younger populations are in the Americas, and even then, Right now, the Americas are believed to have been populated as far back as like 18, 19,000 years ago, thanks to White Sands National Park, which is literally a stone's throw away from where I live. I could drive there in 20 minutes to the visitor center, at least. I can't get to that actual site. I don't think its location is publicly known. But these populations of humans are young in Europe because of the Ice Age and how much of it was covered by ice sheets. It's a fascinating story about the history of maternity and of biology and how molecular biology research affects the world at large. It's not having a material effect, but in a spiritual way, it connects us. So I really love this book. I've reread it only once since I bought it. And I'm willing to bet one of the reasons I purchased it was also because I found a bookmark inside of it. This bookmark isn't a traditional bookmark in the sense that those right there are. Those are a lot of traditional bookmarks or business cards. This one is a advertisement for the 27th annual Vintage Virginia, May 31st and June 1st of 2008. Unlimited tastings, it says. The back of it says, one of Virginia's oldest and largest wine festivals featuring over 50 of Virginia's premier wineries, presented in part by Hampton Inn, Manassas, Virginia. Noteworthy uh, musicians include the funky, jazzy sounds straight from New Orleans, Ivan Neville's Dumpsta Funk, Trombone Shorty, and Orleans Avenue, Jamie McLean, and more, plus local favorites, Scythian, The Craw Daddies, and The Last Train Home. It has a lot of information on this. I'll show you the front. Just look at that. That is a beautiful piece of art. And then on the back, a lot of the information. This right here, I could see the artwork maybe being blown up and put on in a frame. I never went to any of these. I don't know if it's still going on, but this art looks very thematically appropriate to find in The Seven Daughters of Eve. And so I bought it used. I've read it used. I borrowed it from the library more than a decade and a half ago. This is a book that I think a lot of people should be interested in reading. It's, like I said earlier, presented in a way that even someone ignorant of biology could still read it, understand the narrative, and it may be slow at some times when it's a bit technical, but the main matter is engaging and interesting. It's history, but theoretical history, it's about humanity. And so if any of this sounds like a kind of book that you would like to read, 
I would strongly recommend you pick it up. My name is Wildstag, and thank you for tuning in to another used book rant.